Hello and welcome to this episode of Mind the Gap, making education work across the globe with me, Tom Sherrington, and my great partner, Emma Turner. Hello, Emma. Hello, Tom. Are you well? Very good. Yeah, really good. And we are very pleased to have a double header today. The great dream team <laughs> in the house. Uh, Bradley and Pippa Bush, Dr. Pippa Bush, I should say, because it says that on your screen. So welcome to our, our podcast. Thank you. Hi, nice to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, so it's it's interesting because I don't know if, if you get this a lot or, um, you know, the, the fact that you're a couple and you're married and you you both do sort of, sort of work in the educational world. But I wouldn't normally sort of invite people on as a, as a couple, except for the <laughs> fact that you kind of presented yourself as such when uh, I think it was last year at a research ed event. And it, it was just really great. You know, you did this sort of double act. Um, and I don't think every married couple could probably do that as well as you do. <laughs> yeah. but you, but it, so it was, it was kind of, that's what gave, put, it, put that in my head that you were, um, you know, that you that you kind of talk about these things together and there's, there's overlap in your work and that's really interesting. So I just, we, we'll talk a little bit about that talk because to me that, that was a, an important one and it's it's something which stood out for me um, from that from last year's kind of things of things I was thinking about but if you want to just tell people listening about your different work I don't know who wants to go first. Um, Brad off you go. <laughs> I was gonna let you go um yeah uh okay so my background I guess was initially I trained as a sports psychologist um so working mainly in football seeing if we could use psychological research to help footballers kick a ball better um and then moved over did some work with Paralympics GB and eventually yeah at that time we were talking a lot about how do we help our athletes learn better uh and I was lecturing at a college at the time so I kind of had one foot in education and yeah it just kind of seemed that all the research we were talking about with our athletes all of it came from educational psychology um and yet whenever I talked to teachers they didn't know about most of this research because I hate it that research is behind paywalls I think it's really inaccessible and so we kind of about as a company in a drive about 10 or 15 years ago fell into education and loved it and that's most of what we do now we have a little bit of work in sport but yeah 90 percent now is about um teacher training or student workshops around research really so fantastic so you did you you, you developed in a drive coming out of of sports uh, uh work that's interesting i didn't know that and people, yeah. what about you what's 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 your what's your um tell people about your main kind of work yeah so i started off um i was a youth worker i set up a youth club um but then i held at a youth club for special needs children and their siblings because it's quite a different aspect and then i worked a lot in social services child protection and um, youth services um and then i worked in a special school um, for autism and severe learning difficulties and eventually I got on the doctorate to be um, a child and educational psychologist but it's interesting because I think child and educational psychologists are quite often we know very good at doing statutory work and doing education health and care plans and actually we're trained to do so much more I found it really frustrating that I couldn't do all the things I was trained to do and to interact with children and do interventions and Im implement all the research so yeah, so now I um, I, charted, I started the child psychologist so that I could get what I was trained to do out as a service because educational psychologists aren't very good at telling the world what they do other than education, health and care plans. Wow, amazing. So you must have those crazy conversations then. Uh, well, our dinner table, our poor children. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> Can you stop talking about work, please? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that about um, the children, because I saw a thing recently that said, apparently, doctors' kids are more likely to smoke and judges' kids are more likely to be criminals. So basically it means our kids are going to be messed up, is essentially yeah. what, what it probably means. <laughs> Just the way it's going to happen. <laughs> so, Emma, what's, what's, your, what's been your kind of, um, I don't know, take on I don't know either you can pick one of the other <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just fascinated by um Pippa so when you say you're working with the, with children now yes. what is it that you, what does your day look like what do you what do you do in a uh, nobody has a normal day but what <laughs> might be some kind of key common elements that you might be working on well today's a bit of a funny well no I work with um some Premier League uh, families 
And so they have a child psychologist on tap and they just call me with any anything and I provide advice or strategies. Um, so I'm currently at one of their houses at the moment. Um, but then last week I was presenting to Greater Manchester Education Trust about EBSA. Um, I have one-to-one sessions, I run group sessions. Um, I Yeah, it's really, really brilliant and different, but actually it's a really new role that the world doesn't know about because, as I say, educational psychologists just do APDs and EHCPs, um, and that's just not the world I want to be in. Well, that's so uh, interesting. And do, do, what sorts of, I mean, without sort of, you know, because you're actually, I think you're in somebody's house there, what, what sorts of things are they presenting? What sorts of issues are you dealing with? Oh, well, it's also, so I, I'm really interested in special needs, but actually special need it kind of it's every child because you don't need to reach a threshold for me to want to help so I don't need someone to have a diagnosis of autism I don't need someone to have medication for anxiety like if there is a problem presenting then I can figure out strategies um to help that so I had another family where there was a daughter who had a real fear of failure she really wanted to be good at the cross country and she was brilliant and she trained every day and she was eight um, but then on the day she couldn't run um, and so she just kind of fell apart so we, we did an eight-week intervention about her strengths her growth mindset um, and then she's running every race since and she's great and so it's just I think kids need to learn about mental health and negative thoughts and how to process them and I don't think you need to have a special educational need to do that so there's a lot of my work around mental health plus the special educational need side. That's so interesting to me because there's so much work at the moment, so much focus nationally on how best to teach and how to deliver and how to ensure that learning happens, but not necessarily that focus on what it then feels like to be on the receiving end of things. And then and alongside how you just navigate the world and your day as a child and all of the overcoming all of those other kind of potential bumps in the road that so you have on those so so children with spe- like children with special needs, they face every single day in school. They go to a class. They know they're not going to know what's going to go on. They know they don't um, have a history of what happened last week. They know they're going to get called out. They know they miss something. And every day they face that. And I think they're so brave. Mm-hmm. And I think if we could understand just a little bit of the relentlessness of their challenges, I think that would go a long way. Do you think, do you think there's a, a true thought in, in the sort of, quite commonly stated thing at the moment that there's a kind of mental health crisis which is kind of now rather than before and and a lot of and, and still I mean I was in schools this week and last week and you still people talk about since Covid and that sort of and I was saying like are we I mean because I'm not in schools every day so I sort of don't I've lost track of kind of, of whether that's true or not you know since can we still be saying since Covid or, or, but or I think not? so because I think since COVID, children realise that they can stay at home and they can almost vote with their feet. And so there's a lot of EBSA, emotional based school avoidance at the moment. And I hear teachers saying about the attendance rate pre and post COVID. But actually, if you relate it to the world, the attendance rate in offices is very different now because we've learned that we can work differently and have home home working and flexi working. And so I think there's a place for that in society, but I don't think it's very well planned or in, explored at the moment. But no, I, d- I don't think I don't think everyone as an adult has gone back to the office like they did pre-COVID. And I think it's a bit yeah. un- unfair to expect the children to go back to school like they did pre-COVID. I, I suppose I get that with the attendance. I'm thinking, but then it's more the mental health aspect of it. Like are people, because I always think that's so hard to track, isn't it? You know, like even in the in the PISA tables where they were saying like British children are um, unhappier. But I was, I'm, I'm a bit sceptical about that. I don't know if I am, because I always feel like, Maybe British children are just more likely to say they're unhappy because they're that's British. <laughs> well, it's but how do you know? If, how do you know if they actually are? You know, it's, it's, I find that interesting to. to I mean, a- a- anecdotally, when we do our workshops five or ten years ago with students, we'd always have teachers say, "There's one or two ch- children in the room who you have to be aware of either eating disorders or self harm or something like that," and it kind of it stood out because it wasn't the norm. Whereas now we regularly get told five, 10 students, whatever the number is in a room. It seems, anecdotally anyway, it seems to be much higher for those sort of issues. Do you think that's potentially, not, not the eating disorders, that that aspect, but just generally, is potentially, and Pippi probably had to shed some light on this, so I'm going to phrase it really badly, <laughs> um, <laughs> is the fact that there are children who 
missed key developmental windows that would be fairly normal and straightforward his historically, but they had such a strange time in that window that that's having some kind of knock on whether that be kind of a, whether they were preschool age, whether they were kind of adolescent, whether they just kind of had a weird window, a very unusual window. I totally agree. So I think all year threes and fours are having difficulty with handwriting at the moment because they miss their reception years and they just haven't got the development in their bones, in their hands. Um, I think most of year ones at the moment interrupt too much because when they were at home and learning social etiquette, there were no other interactions other than the home. So I know five and six year olds who still don't realise that when you're on the phone, you you kind of wait till the end of a phone call to interrupt. Um, so, yeah, I can kind of tell what stage they are now and where their difficulties are at what point in lockdown they missed is there anything that schools can like quick fix to do that you would say right with this this is what your year ones need to do this is what year threes need to do this is what year nines need to do well, that would be nice wouldn't it um, <laughs> i think i think the overall thing is to to just recognize so i have this lovely slide i use and it's a koala holding onto the stump of a tree, shaking and someone saying, well, this koala has got a mental health problem. And actually in the picture, all the trees have been cut down and it's like a normal response to an unusual situation. And I think it's quite good to remember that at times. So I think making the environment OK to fail, OK to discuss and um, as low stakes as possible. I think that's a really easy, quick fix that every teacher can do in a school building. Mm -hmm. It's really just... my my children are just about to turn 13, 10 and 7. And I can see the one who coped better with the with the kind of changes with the eldest one, because child development wise, she'd already passed all those really early milestones. And the one that is that has struggled the most is the one in the middle, who was sort of between five and seven when they were kind of in the house so it's, it's fascinating to think that that's not just a potentially not just a little anecdotal case study in my own house <laughs> no anecdotally <laughs> it's a whole population in my, in my life, but I don't have any research to back that up um yeah. interesting you say like, about special I needs with I oh, interesting you were talking about special needs with um lockdown because actually uh, for a lot of children, it took away a lot of the demands that they weren't coping with. So I have a lot of consultations where they go, oh, lockdown was great. Actually, it was a transition back to school where the problems were because in lockdown, they didn't have to face the, the transitions of every class. They didn't have to face the social demands and um, they just had to do their work, which they did brilliantly and move on. And so actually, there's a lot of children out there where lockdown learning suited them. And I think the transition back to the, the pre-COVID learning is is the difficult part well it's so hard isn't it to get it all right so i mean it's it, it, so many aspects of this i find interesting so i i find teachers sometimes um, are imposing their own sort of issues onto students in in their their anxiety about their anxiety <laughs> and you're thinking and this is one of the things I, I find so interesting like what's the response so you've got the diagnosis so you've got the kind of this child's not anxious for one reason or other or they're they're struggling in some way and then you've got this sort of agenda around resilience and students having to kind of kind of cope or manage their emotions and punch through to the other side and, and, and overcome. But I find sometimes that's that's the problem that people sort of pull back when they could be a bit more demanding of the student. And so they resist that. And then the student doesn't learn to cope because they're not being asked to. And it's a real tension. It reminds me of one of the the inner drive pieces which I know I've referred to you before because it <laughs> I don't know we should cherry pick the evidence that, that, that <laughs> like. but it is one I, I like and because it, it sings to me and it's a study and you can tell me about this it's about it was a study which basically compared comfort based support with yeah. strategy orientated support and it was sort of saying you know which one and there was a study and you can tell tell us about it, a bit about it maybe and you, do you remember the one that I'm talking yeah, about? yeah it's a really good study uh do you want to tell, tell people a bit about yeah. it then? Because this is why, I, rather than me making up my own version. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's a good one. And it, I, I, it gets, I think, to the heart of what you were just saying is I hate the framing of resilience as the opposite of anxiety, as in like you're either nervous or you have to toughen up and it's one or the other. I think that's not from the research that I speak to. That's not how they frame it. Uh, that study was really nice. So I think the study was... Uh, it was a hypothetical situation. So you take a teacher and you say, hypothetically, it's the first exam of the year and one of your students got a really low mark. 
um, how do you respond? And they found teachers varied in their response. So they said those, um, some went for a strategy approach of, you know, um, you need to practice more. Let me explain the step by steps again. Um, I'll set you extra work so you can kind of catch up um, very much on how to get better at the task. Whereas others went for a more comfort approach, which was essentially, let me make you feel better about your failure. You know, it doesn't matter that you did badly at this. I'm sure you've got other strengths. Um, I won't call on you in class because I don't embarrass you. Very much geared around that sort of making you feel better about the failure. And what's fascinating about the study is when they then interviewed students, they said, hypothetically, you did badly. Your teacher responds in either X or Y. They found those who'd had that comfort response they misinterpreted the teacher's good intentions to comfort them as almost proof that their teacher doesn't believe they can get better. And so they actually found the comfort response was actually more demotivating and lowered self expectations. Uh, I guess the only caveat for me with that study is the nature of research is it has to be quite binary. Like we're comparing comfort versus strategy. And I think in the real world, obviously, you can have, there's important to have room for both. Uh, so it's not anti comfort. But sometimes I do worry that the pendulum has swung so much that our first response is always just to make people feel better about their failure and hope they avoid any discomfort ever. Um, and we almost talk about stuff like anxiety when sometimes we mean upset. Uh, and therefore, we don't give them an opportunity to, to learn how to get better at the task. It's just focused on that short term insulation from failure. Yeah, and it's, I see that played out just in the dynamics of a classroom where I sort of joke about it in the training, like, you know, teachers are facing the class and they're looking at who to ask. And they kind of, they're looking at, and they're looking at uh, some kids and they're going, oh, God, no, not you. Because <laughs> like, they're just gonna, that, that's just going to be awkward. And they'll just go somewhere it's less awkward. And you think, well, that that kid never gets that, get, gets over that. They're in that little ghetto of, that little silo of awkward table. And um, sometimes there's a teaching assistant next to them who, is like protecting them from <laughs> shielding them from the awkwardness. And it's sort of like, and it's, yeah. it's not quite the right approach is it? it's sort of like, come on in, come on, be part of this. Come and join yeah. us. So we were talking life. about this the other day, weren't we Pippa? Cause we we're talking about like, so the phrase we use when we do our workshop is for that is kind of the Superman complex. Like you want to, with good intentions, save people. You don't want them. You get into education because you want to help, but then how much support is too much support? Uh, and I recently had a teacher, I think it was Rachel Ball, uh, talk about scaffolding. And she was saying the, the skill actually isn't in the scaffolding. It's knowing when to reduce it. That's the really hard part. Uh, and I think for teaching assistants, that's a really interesting dynamic is where do you draw the line between I'm here to help, but what does good help look like? And what does it not look like is it's just a really hard balancing act. It's not easy, I think. All schools are so good at putting in support, but then there's no exit plan, I feel. I feel like when you put in support, you should always figure out how we're going to teach them independence to do that strategy without us. Um, so, and that takes time. And especially with um, school avoidance, I have this um, analogy of scales where the, the demand is too big and the coping skills are too small. And so the scales are imbalanced. And um, But then what schools do is they give them loads of coping skills and lower the demand and it's still imbalanced just the other direction. And what we need to do is level it out. So we need to increase the coping skills and a little bit of demand so that it keeps it balanced, then get more coping skills and more demand. And that's how we teach them to to have to approach yeah because the avoidance just creates a cycle and it's a, just a really hard cycle to get out of especially with anxiety because the the avoidance makes you miss a class and then you actually are behind even if you just thought you were a bit behind before and you weren't then you are then you have missed out on some social situations and that cycle just keeps going and the more we make them comfortable the deeper down that cycle they're going to get and so I think the secret is well it's not really a secret but we need to break the cycle and help them deal and manage with that uncomfortable feeling in a safe environment and then ha help them keep going it seems to me like one of the key issues there and it's like it's almost like you have to educate people to understand that your emotions are normal and natural and kind of inevitable and not to be afraid of and then so that that feeling you have of being a bit awkward in class because you've missed a week and now you're back, it's going to be awkward. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's fine. That's right? okay. <laughs> You'll get through it. <laughs> it's just... Feelings come and they go. They're going to feel yeah. awkward for a bit. You're not going to feel awkward for your life. Like, let's let's do it. 
so I mean, yeah. So Emma, what do you think? I mean, I've, I've, just... I've gone off on I've gone off somewhere in my head thinking about training wheels on a bike, so, uh, you know, stabilizers <laughs> on a bike and scaffolding. As in your scaffolds in your teaching should be the stabilizers on the bike so that you can still be on the same journey with everybody else, but no one wants to be, you know, 14, 15 years old still with stabilizers on their bike. The aim is to ride the bike and get those off as, as soon as possible. But if you don't have them in the first place, then you can't navigate the route with everybody else. You're stuck sort of like walking along with not being able to ride the bike. So I was just thinking. Um, also, the confidence that comes with once you're up and running with your stabilizers on means you want to take them off as well, which means that you are kind of inherently feeling better and more comfortable because you are achieving something. So I was just thinking about the importance of scaffolds being there to enable you to be scaffolded into the learning, but also that then you've got to go because you don't want to end up necessarily being the only kid on the block with your stabilizers still on. <laughs> I love that analogy and what it makes me think of is neurodiversity um, they have balance bikes to start with instead of stabilizers it's, and it's the same process it's just a different track and that's totally fine it's like lots of interventions suit 80% of the population that's great that's 20% of every class that it doesn't suit though that's okay what are we going to do for them. Mm. It's interesting that like, I'm glad you mentioned the balance bike because I was thinking when Emma was saying that like I use I've used the stabilizers analogy many times um, and a number of times people have come up to me after a little session and said, you know, most people just use balance bikes. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I, right. Ironically, ironically, my husband is a triathlete and bought all of our kids balance bikes. From age <laughs> yeah. he, he would be so furious with me talking about <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They've all been trained from the beginning on a balance bike. It's just like we're, we're, we're scaffolding the, the wrong thing. But this is this is the thing I'd, on, I'm going to sort of bring around to, to to you to talk about your your double act uh, masterclass because I felt like this was so interesting. So what you did is that you went through a kind of a bunch of things which studies show are true for jet for, for learners in general. And then you know Pippa, you came in with a kind of and so for special needs, it's even more. It's almost like and there are loads of them. One of them one of them was things like um, thinking time. And ever since you said that, and this is where you you know you have influence. So like you, you th those things are so great because you part you plant an idea, and then I, I go into lessons a lot. And so just the last two days, I, I was I probably saw thirty teachers the last two days. And you sit in the I always go to the back of the class, and you sit, and the teacher sets a task. It could be whiteboards, it could be in their books, it could be pair share, and the teachers have got a quiz, a do now, quiz on the board. And the teacher says, okay, guys, come on in, questions on the board. And this, this girl sitting next to you going, like, diligently trying, thinking she's on number two. There's six questions. And then she's thinking, oh, what is it? And then the teacher says, right, okay, answers are on the board. <laughs> and check your own. Um, how did you get on? Okay, well, okay, just green pen the right, wrong answers. And we're away. It's like, I think you are kidding. I think it was like, it's barely got started. The rug's been totally pulled from under her, and she has, and she still doesn't know that she didn't get to the uh, the other ones. It's just, it's so cruel. It feels like that timing had literally nothing to do with that child at all. Nothing. It was to do with some other agenda. So that to me is like ever since you pointed that out, the thinking time, I've just been like hyper conscious of it. So just. I mean, I, that was, so that's just one thing, but I don't know, one of you, would you want to just talk through the kind of your thought process for that kind of the way that you link those ideas together? Because I thought it was, it, was, it was exceptional. Oh, well, thanks for the kind words. When we saw you in the audience, we uh, wanted to make sure we uh, did the topic justice on the day. Um, yeah, I guess it kind of came about the presentation in that area was we get a lot of requests between us on how can you... And I'm guessing you must have it as well, both of you, when you do training is how do you tailor stuff for certain students? And I hear this all the time when you talk about rose and shine or retrieval or whatever it is. And I'm pretty convinced now, like good practice, like it's, it's, it's the same philosophy, it's the same principles, uh, but they just might need to be adapted. And when we were talking about it, I guess we kind of just felt there's loads of research on retrieval, on wait times and cold calling and all that kind of stuff. But most of it is done not on send population. Uh, and so therefore you always kind of need, 
your best guess, which is kind of what Pippa's experience is on, is how do we apply it to or tweak it? Uh, it's not a different philosophy. Like wait times are really important for all students, uh, but there might be reasons. Maybe you're better place, Pippa, to talk about why that wait time might need to be extended for for certain students, as an example. Okay. To send students, it's it's such a sweeping generalisation, isn't it? Yeah. So some people might just need a bit more time to um, process the language. And if you think about schools, it's so language heavy, isn't it? So some special needs uh, children just can't process the language as quickly, but they can process visual information really quickly. Um, so there's lots of things. So just because you're speaking doesn't mean that the, the person's interpreting it at the same rate as you're speaking. Then they have to then locate their knowledge and pin it to whatever knowledge they already had. And then they have to construct a sentence verbally to say it with the whole, if I say it wrong, my class will laugh at me pressure. Um, and so there's so many areas that they just might need a bit more time in that honestly, just giving them a bit more time ticks so many boxes, kind of irrelevant of which area it is they need the help with. And I mean, I'm guessing the elephant in the room with all this stuff is what I often hear anyway, is there's just too much content to cover in the curriculum. There is pressure to go quickly to cover more stuff. And I guess the question is, does an extra few seconds per question, how much impact does that then make on the amount you can cover? Um, because it is a bit of a balancing act. But if we believe, and the research is pointing this way, that successful retrieval is our best bet for learning or one of our best bets for learning, I should say, then yeah, we just kind of felt if you're rushing that, actually it's one of the most unfair things you can do because the gap just gets wider and wider. Those who can quickly learn, get the benefit of successful retrieval. The example you gave Tom of the girl who doesn't get to do that, her learning gets short circuited, essentially her retrieval. And so mm. therefore next time the gap gets wider and wider. And actually when you think about it like that, it's actually probably one of the most fair, and inclusive and supportive of all students. Um, I put cold calling probably in that as well. It's saying everyone has the right uh, to to learn and to contribute, not just the loudest and the quickest. It's not going to be dominated or monopolized by a select few. Well, you brought, up, you brought up the CC word, the cold call. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, so this is I, I want let, let's talk about that a bit because I feel like. Again, I mean, done well. It's just an. I'd say it's an essential technique. I don't. Even, I don't think you can run a class really well, inclusively, unless you are giving everyone a chance to think and sort of participate. But it's the it's the common. It's the question I get asked and yeah, same. Challenged by more than anything is, you know, and and I remember as this happened to me as about four weeks ago as an, an event where this woman came up to me at a break in, uh, in a training day and she said. Tom, can I just say that you were saying all that thing about the, the cold calling and you were acting out in the session. The whole time I was petrified. I was, I was just quaking, thinking, oh, please don't pick me. Please don't pick me. And then you picked my person next to me and I was just, and it's like, I was thinking, and I was thinking, God, look, look at you, you're sort of crippled by this anxiety. And then I'm asking you to go and do this technique in a class. It's just, we've got so many things to unpick it. But you see that, like, that was her response as a teacher, never mind. And I was saying, yeah. I thought I was trying to make it feel sort of warm. And yeah. Happy. So but I guess there's, there's a couple of things. And I guess maybe after we can talk about how it might be adapted for, for some students is, I mean, there was a recent study, I think it was just a few months ago, which I thought was brilliant, that basically looked at two different ways you could do cold calling. So in the research, they were talking about it as collaborative versus compliant. So collaborative, which is very in sync with what I hear Doug Lamov say, describes it as an invitation to join the discussion. It's saying like, you know, um, it's associated with like uh, voice equity. Uh, we want to have authentic, genuine conversations and everyone's opinion matters. Whereas the other way, this compliant, if you see it as this, you have to participate and you have to comply. And it's very question answer, it's very kind of rigid. Often that can lead to anxiety, the research found. So it's all about, yeah, as you kind of lose it, can you do it in a warm way? And the research that stood out for me the most was if you do it repeatedly and regularly, uh, I think they found within a few weeks in the study, about 90% of the class were volunteering to participate. So it's not seen, actually, they want to participate because that's just how we talk in our class. And I'm seeing a growing trend of students 
not with these are without EHCP plans, uh, by either them or their parents trying to opt them out. We hear lots of schools tell us this that they get a bit nervous or a bit shy and they can, can we not call on them. And I just kind of think we do those students a disservice. Um, this is those who don't have a diagnosis. I think the diagnosis is different, but for those who don't have that diagnosis and, or don't meet that threshold, this might be the last place they get to develop these skills. And I'd rather them do that in a warm, nurturing way, because if we just don't ever help them develop those skills, I think we just set them up for more problems later on. Now, the question that we try to answer in that presentation is, what can you do with cold calling for students who do get genuinely stressed? Uh, and I think what I found interesting anyway was when I talked to people is going, some of the benefit of cold calling isn't just the one you're asking, it's everyone else, because everyone else is expecting to be called upon. So if there's ways that you can give one or two students a heads up that they're going to be called upon, but everyone else still gets the benefit of the cold calling because they don't know that student's being called upon. I think that's something you talked about. Yeah, it? so it drives me mad when they go, oh, I'm Miss Clark says I've got social anxiety and you're not allowed to call on me because I'm, I'm too scared to speak in class. And I go, OK, great, but that's not the issue. So um, how about when we do some, um, well, I'll say, right, everyone have a two minute discussion. Let's let's talk to your partner about this. I might pop into that pupil and go, what, what are your thoughts? I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, I'm going to ask you that in a moment. OK, so exactly what you just said. That's right. I'm going to ask. I'd love the class to hear that. And then you go back and you go, right, anyone got anything to contribute? And then they know they're right. They know it's a warm and inviting atmosphere. They're prepared to do it. And that's, again, it's just cutting this avoidance cycle. I don't think the avoidance cycle is helpful for anyone in any situation. But then I also take everyone already has said about the teacher response and the teacher anxiety and how that poor lady in your um, training was was just petrified. And that's a valid feeling. And I just wonder why we think that that's different for children versus adults. It's like what we, Brad especially, tries to really implement the knowledge we know when we're training. So if we know that too many words on a slide isn't good, we don't put too many words on a slide when we're training people about it. So like, I just think there's so much reflectiveness to do about our own well-being and the pupils. I think it's really, really easy to just focus on the kids. Just two quick things, if I may, which I found interesting was... Um... I spoke to a researcher recently who specializes in think pair share and he was saying he thinks that before cold calling is brilliant specifically he looks at nervous students mm. uh, and he said for in his study he found that initial validation from one peer uh, and being able to test the water was transformational with that then follows with cold calling which I thought was quite nice uh, but I always remember Emma it was you who I think told me about um how it sometimes students always try to work out the patterns, right? And so they kind of work out that it's easy if cold calling is, is equated with no hands up, then the way to get asked is to never put your hand up and the way to be avoided is to put your hand up because they always try and work out what's the pattern and what's the rule. Uh, so you can see how this stuff goes wrong with all good intentions. Really interesting because um, I, when I was ahead in my school, we didn't have cold calling because we kind of flipped it and we, we did this thing called stop. So we, our culture was, if you don't understand what the teacher's saying, it's your responsibility to stop them and ask for clarification. And, and the assumption then by the teacher is everybody's following this. Right. Everybody understands it, so I can ask anybody. I don't have to do a specific cold calling. And we did it right from year one. And you, know, you have to frame it with, um, uh, yeah, I know you don't know this yet, so don't start saying stop just yet. <laughs> let, let me get a couple of minutes into it before you all start stopping me. But by year six, it was so rich because you you knew you could ask absolutely anybody anything. And the children would say, just, I don't understand why you put the seven there. I was with you with until you put that there. And I don't quite understand why that goes there. Or um, I know you've just used that word, but I'm not sure what it means. Or does it mean this? And it, it was really interesting to not do cold calling and to put the onus back onto the children to actually say, well, if you don't understand, it's your learning, you need to ask us. And it was, by the time they got to year six, they were so independent and they, there was no fear because they were, and you know, it was just linked to, well, this is what, this is the narrative you're meant to be following. If you don't, just stop me and I can explain it. And then it did mean that we could call on anybody. Without and out, having to do cold calling. Out of curiosity, 
So I just think back to when I was in year nine and I valued social status and being cool in front of my yeah. friends more than any learning. With your gut thinking, do you think that would work well in secondary school as I well? I don't know. It worked, it, worked, it worked really well in year six. Yeah. And our secondary, our secondary feed, the secondary that we fed to, came down and watched the year sixes and were just like, wow, okay. this, is, this is what we want to develop with Key Stage 3 in our setting so they began to trial it but then i left and i don't quite know how it how it how it panned out in key stage God, I'd, have been, I'd have been terrible if, if i could just stop you there for a minute so <laughs> <laughs> well we did no. it with lots of, there were lots of other strategies that kind of sat around it like yeah. i'm just thinking of one kid i can see him in my head he would have talked for england so we had to do things like give him three cubes once he'd got rid of his cubes because he gave me a cube every time he'd made his once he'd got rid of those that's you that's you done for this little bit of the session so think carefully about where you want to make your contribution the other thing we do is we'd or we'd give everybody one and say by the end of today you've got to got rid of it by say i don't care when you contribute but you're going to contribute at some point and you get rid of that when you've made your contribution i may come to you again but you've definitely got to contribute once so there's lots of things that sat around it that and it linked to our behaviour system as well. So they got praise and reward and, you know, it was championed across the school when you were taking control of your own learning and what have you. But it, it meant that we kind of avoided the cold call nervousness. I think, just, I think like, I mean, I, I like, I'm so, I'm, to be honest, I'm, I'm just going to take away from, from this, amongst other things, the validation of something which I feel is very natural, which is that talk it warms people up it loosens people up and when you've got that kind of blood out of a stone moment of a lesson it's such an obvious thing to say well i tell you what you're just not you know t turn to your partner talk it through and then you get just it liberates people and you just get a way better response yeah often it's just this thing of just not what you're cold calling on you know and and, and embedded in the cold call technique which we always train is the thinking and and i think that's interesting because if you can't Thinking it suggests that you've got the stuff to manipulate, and if you don't have that, you can't do any thinking. So if you're if you're hanging people out to dry on a kind of, come on, what's the capital of Somalia? Come on, yes, you do. Have a think. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know it. Like I can't think that because I don't know it. And so you're, and and then people have had a few of those moments. So they just think. But if you're saying, you know here's here's some information or listen to the story and you've just heard it or you all, all the ideas are there you just need to think with them and it, the, the thinking is something it's possible for everybody i just it's way more productive and then it's consolidatory and and you're rehearsing giving answers so i feel like part of the anxiety is just poor question choice and yeah. uh, you know you're and and then and that comes down to the curriculum again and, and what sorts of things you would cold call on and half the time you'd be better off doing whiteboards and everyone seeing and then you can ask the student to, to discuss their answer when they've done it right rather than calling them when they've got in, and, and they don't know if they're right and it's just a whole all that anxiety kicks in from that well, but what frustrates me is when teachers just panic pack it panic in the face of it and they say well the best answer is just not to do it at all and just have the hands up and calling out again i think well well, that doesn't make anything better, does it? It's it's, it's weird, isn't it? I was just thinking, I, first of all, um, that ticks so many boxes at that strategy you were talking about. And then your suggestion when um, cold calling on real factual information, but I get quite on a high horse about differentiating and adapting teaching for maths and English is really good and well done in schools, but doing it for social learning is really difficult. So what, could, we, could we do cold calling with the aim of getting them to integrate and discuss and contribute as opposed to actually giving us any answers could that be the first step could it be i'm ex i'm cold calling because i want you to contribute to anything i don't necessarily want you to contribute a right answer i want you to just speak out loud in a class could that not be a first step especially for send students where it's irrelevant of what they say it's that they are commenting or they are contributing what, what yeah, so having ideas like I, I know that some people say like in english literature you know you can't mandate that children have an idea like what ideas would you have and you can <laughs> it's like saying go and write a tune it's like you know, i guess you can't be creative on demand or have an insight so all those things like where it, it goes you're right it, it just sort of 
So what sorts of, when, when you're thinking that, Pippa, what sorts of things are you thinking would be like the kinds of questions where you can just participate without it needing to be knowledge based? Well, I was thinking that, um, what was I thinking? Yeah, good question. So coming, contributing to the class, but I, I really liked how you created a culture of contributing and saying, stop, I don't understand. I think that's, that's contributing, isn't it? Having the, the confidence to say, I'm not quite sure on that, or I don't follow that. And I think that's a really good answer to a lot of questions, because a lot of kids a, can't ask for help or can't acknowledge when they're wrong um, or can't appreciate when someone else makes a mistake. I think all those things can be targeted really easily in a classroom environment. And that's me why this stuff is beautifully messy, because you can start talking about cold calling in terms of retrieval. So, you know, if we think we need to get students to retrieve and wait times and you do cold calling as a vehicle for that, but then you take it to Emma, you are alluding to it being part of a wider behavioral system. So then you can get in the psychology of motivation and then Pips, you're talking about like group dynamics. And so you've got this one thing of cold calling that actually spreads out. And so it's not about the strategy in isolation. It's kind of how it fits into the wider picture. Um, one of the things that has always stood with me, uh, I, I interviewed Doug Lamov on his like best tip that he told me was he thinks that Colquhoun is really good for listening skills. So he one of his phrases he likes to use at the end was um, like, Emma, let's start with you. And by saying that, it means that we all know that that's just the beginning. So I need to listen to what Emma says because I'm going to have to comment on what Emma says. So actually cold calling now is a, is a listening, is a tool to help improve listening. It's not even about the memory and retrieval. And, but it all fits in so it's actually this really nuanced thing mm. and complex though it looks really straightforward at the start you go just anti hands up but like it's so much uh, so much from that yeah I, I suppose uh, you know what i find i, I seem to i saw a, a beautiful lesson last year a, a teacher doing a, a nurture class um you know there's about eight kids uh, really like they you know they're in this nurture group and the transition from primary to secondary and it's one of those things where you think you know they for whatever reason they're in there and she was trying to get them to talk and she did this it was like a, like a beautiful sequence so you start with pair share so they're all talking and they're, they're talking about a story and they have to come up with some ideas about the the, the mood in the forest and why what what the, the the kind of the setting and how it affected the mood and what was it what was it about the forest and she made them all like partner a you go first and partner b you go second so they'd swap taking turns and then she was uh, cold calling them by saying right so that's here um sebastian what did you think what were you saying and he would they had to just say what were you saying so where we were saying this they didn't have to have an answer we were we thought this great and that's interesting and then she spoke to them and a couple of others but then this was the genius then she said does anyone have any other ideas we haven't heard yet and so the hands up come right and the girl came this girl put her hand up and and she just next she's just like gave this answer which was like golden it was just beautiful and everyone's like going, wow that's just so insightful but if she hadn't had the hands up for anything else we would never have heard that yeah but if, she, if she just said cold call cold call she might not she might have missed that kid so i thought that was just that to me is that how it works pair share cold call and then hands up to fit in and then you've got like it kind of just works as a kind of Oh, I, I yeah i don't think any technique oh any advocate that i've spoken to about question technique they the people who think about this most always talk about a range of things it's not just mm. only doing cold calling uh Pippa, i saw your eyes light up uh so you probably don't know this Pippa did her dissertation on nurture groups um, oh, did you? so <laughs> i saw your eyes light up there. <laughs> i think i'm very impressed with nurture groups <laughs> my, my dissertation was um how is the social and emotional well-being curriculum delivered successfully and the answer was in nurture groups basically um and yeah so the thing with nurture groups is you have to have two adults because children see and can learn to negotiate and i love how you were saying they differentiated and adapted the teaching to teach them turn taking and contribution and i do have these little things like little lovely sentences i i think are magic and one of them is anything else i think it's such an inviting thing to say anything else and and then allowing time and silence and embracing that for anyone to contribute so yeah that's one of my psychology magic phrases is anything else i know one of the other phrases that uh you like i think tom you said and uh that you quite like this one a while ago because you came up with doing blank page them yeah you, you, blank you, page you like them. there's so much anxiety facing a blank blazing white 
a huge white page. Where do I start? Where do I begin? Where do I end? Just I've, I've, Pippa, I've used that so many times. <laughs> it's just, it's just genius. It's good, it's, isn't it? It's so, it's so, it's so, it's so blooming obvious. <laughs> yeah, and yet, <laughs> yeah. Don't blank page them. It's so hard for those kids. Where? How do I start? God, Make the first it's... mark for them. Literally mark the page, and it takes <laughs> away all that anxiety of like, where do I start? It doesn't matter. Miss has put a star in the corner. Like um, another one I do is take them to A and E if they ever have. Um, I don't actually mean take them to A and E, but when they ever have like really absolute language, like I've never do this, and I'm always like that. You can look for alternatives and exceptions. And that's, is there any time that that hasn't happened? Or is there one time you felt cross and not done X, Y, and Z? So uh, taking them to a and e is another favourite. Oh, I like it. See, this is all good stuff. So <laughs> Emma, um, anything else? <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about the blank paging in that that doesn't happen in EYFS provision because when they're accessing the provision, there is always a prompt or a provocation or a something to start the thinking off. You, you never go to a, a, an area in provision in foundation stage and don't know what to do. There's always something to start off the thought process. And I just think that, as you were talking, I was thinking that's another thing that EYFS do beautifully that doesn't always translate uh, into that later journey in education, that kind of, this is not necessarily modeling, but this is an idea. This is a provocation for your thinking. Well, it's just a, a non-verbal prompt, isn't it? If we just take mm. children with verbal difficult, uh, verbal processing difficulties, that you've just told them for 10 minutes all about the information and given them a bank page. But if you put things on the page, you're just using their visual skills instead of their verbal ones. And the, the mm. processing is different and a lot less demand for them, potentially. Um, another favourite phrase is... Um, thank you for telling me, because when you disagree with them, <laughs> but you're really glad that they contributed, you don't want to tell them they're wrong, you don't want to face it there and then, but you're really glad they contributed, so thank you for telling me, moving on, uh, so I, if I ever say thank you for telling me, I generally mean you're wrong, but I'm not going to discuss it now. Wait a minute, you say that to me, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, Penny dropped the, it. The, the this is inside the last night's dinner time. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, Thank, thank you for telling me, Brad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're getting our, we're getting a little nudge from from uh, our, our producer to 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 get to the end. I was just, God, I can't believe the time. I'm looking at the clock there. But so, just give it. What, what just each of you take a turn. What what's coming next for you? What what sorts of things are you working on? Uh, and and you know, that people can look forward to, um, or, or find find you. Um, I've uh, got the childpsych.co.uk. Um, so I'm starting to run intervention groups like after school clubs. I'm trying to make interventions affordable and accessible and not have to have a diagnosis or a threshold. Um, I'm working with lots of private families, um, just working on family dynamics or um, I'm doing lots of training, CPD days. Um, Brad, what about you? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so m much the same, I guess. We're, um, I guess one thing we're quite focused on in the drive at the moment is I love in-person training. It's the thing I do the most and clock up a lot of miles, but you know, there's only so much you can do in a year and you can't be at two places at once. And I always, we worry a bit that you have these great inset days and then you always wonder how does stuff embed or drip feed or ongoing. I think that's a real challenge. Um, so we've got our teacher CPD Academy. Uh, we're really lucky. We're collaborating with some awesome researchers and teachers. Um, so hopefully to make CPD more as accessible as possible um and yeah just hopefully start more professional dialogue within schools about uh, applying research so that's the sort of thing that schools sign up to and then they can access like talks from yeah people. so uh so we've got a mix we've got kind of these self-access modules which i think are really good as beginner guides uh the part that i love on it the most is our expert insight section so basically we because i said earlier i hate research being behind paywalls uh, we've got these five minute videos with researchers where we just ask them the kind of big questions we think everyone wants to know that they've studied, like the research we did think pair share on nervous students or research on feedback and just making them bite size, just like five minute. Here's a question. What are your thoughts as the expert? Um, and I think they're really good at explaining the research, but then there's still an onus on the individual teacher to go, but how does, do I apply this in my context? as opposed to just being given the answer, because I don't think off-the-shelf stuff really works. 
Wow, brilliant stuff. And I know that you've been, I've, I've seen various threads and stuff that Jade Pierce and some other people. Yeah. Are, I mean, know. yeah, she, 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 she's fantastic. So she came up with the idea of basically having a, a research journal uh, kind of club, essentially. So each quarter, we talk about 10 studies that have been released in the last year. Um, I talk a bit about the research and Jade builds on that and also talks about the implications. Um, and so, yeah, we're running our Spotlight series again next year. Thanks for reminding me to do the plug. I would have got a kick <laughs> for not doing that. Well, I'll see. It's so interesting, isn't it, Emma? Brilliant. Very much so. I'm a huge fan of Inner Drive and the work that they do. So I'm constantly well, cyber stalking the site. <laughs> well, without um, being too mutual fan club, uh, yeah, huge fan of your guys' pods. Uh, I was saying to Pippa when we were talking about it the last week. Uh, yeah, I, I listened to every episode. I thought your ones with Sarah Cottingham and Sufian were unbelievable. Um, and yeah, that, yeah. That, that was real highlights. They were. It's it's great to have people give a chance to people oh. hear, hear them speak at length. And, but that, and it's, it's been the same here, you know. Yeah, honestly, the, your one with Sufian. So like, it's a different area of what I work in. But I left there motivated. I was going. That's some energy to make change in the world. Um, so yeah, uh, mutual fans of what you guys do as well. Oh, thank you so much. Honestly, this has been great. I love it. I love, I, I, I've been really enjoying the dynamics. Like we, Emma and I have this sort of <laughs> on screen to so have to take it in turns and listen to each other and stuff and watching you do the same. <laughs> so look, honestly, thank you so much uh, to both of you. Um, thank, thanks to Bradley and Pippa Bush and uh, look forward to, you know, keeping in contact with you. Thanks to everyone listening to Mind the Gap. We're great. We're, we're, we're grateful for all the listeners we have. Thanks for to, to, to Luke for helping us get back up and running and uh, we'll see you all really soon thank you so much cheers thanks for having us thank you thank you for listening to mind the gap i'm emma turner and i've been presenting with my co-host tom sherrington if you enjoyed this episode please leave us a review share on social media and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts find us on our youtube channel search for Mind the Gap with Tom and Emma or head over to Spotify for an audio version. This podcast was produced in association with Haringey Education Partnership and our producer for today's episode was Luke Kemper. <laughs>